Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. It is an honor to be with you. I've had the opportunity of speaking at a lot of ISSA uh, chapters, and you guys have the most fun. Let me just put it that way. I was in Charlotte a couple of years ago. They don't have anything like this. This is anybody from Charlotte here? Uh, good. Okay, we can talk freely. Um, I think with the with the handout of the liquor, what we need to do is every time you hear the word ransomware. You have to take a shot, okay? We'll see what happens by the end of our time together. You like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am a field CISO for Cohesity. I spent, uh, I've only really been with them less than a year. Uh, I spent 16 years as the evangelist for a company known as Symantec. And I had the opportunity of traveling around the world and, uh, and meeting with customers. And uh, as you can see, I am one. Uh, uh, I'm an, uh, as my wife likes to call it, a C-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S -S -I um, and so I'm excited to hear what you're doing in that sense and that uh, support. Uh, we need more of us. We need more of us out there. I am really uh, happy to be standing here. I'm actually happy to be standing today. Um, a, a few years ago, uh, not too long ago, I started feeling poor and uh, I travel all the time and I was on the road having all sorts of weird feelings and I said I may need to go to the doctor and and see what's going on, and so I go and have all these tests, and finally the, my physician says, well, I we kind of think we need to check your heart out and see what's going on there, so go see this guy. So I go see the guy, and they, okay, you need a stress test. Anybody been through this stress test thing? You know, you know what I'm talking about. You get on the treadmill, they hook you up to uh, a, a small computer, and you start going, and you go, and you go, and then at the end of the, uh, at the end of the test, they lay you down and they take an echocardiogram and they look at your heart and see what's going on. And so I did all they wanted. I went as fast as I could, as fast as they wanted, as far as they wanted, as steep as they wanted. And then I laid down and they started looking at it and you could hear the nurses kind of going, mm, 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 yeah, yeah. it's like, great. So I get the result and the result says, go talk to this other guy. <laughs> So I go talk to the other guy, and he's an, called an interventionist, and he says, well, you look at this thing, it looks like you're, uh, you may need a stent. So let's, let's do that. So it's an angiogram. Anybody been through an angiogram? Good. Don't ever try to do this, okay? So they put you on a table, and you're flat out, and you're kind of sedated, and they, they take a catheter, and they put it in your femoral artery, which is, you know, kind of a little private area there. And they go up and they start looking at things. And you're, you're kind of sedated. And I remember, all I remember was the, the interventionist was very frustrated. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. And I felt, just even in my sedation, I felt unnerved, right? And then finally, he said four words I'll never forget. He said, stop, shut it down. And I'll never forget going, that's not good. Okay. <laughs> So he goes out and makes my, talks to my wife and then explains. He said, this is much worse than we thought. It's clearly hereditary, but I could not even get my instruments in to where I needed to be. So you need to go talk to this other guy. <laughs> and he's the surgeon. So we get this ready. We go down and we talk to the surgeon. And for the first time, I get to see this. This is me. This is actually a picture of my angiogram. And my doctor, my physician, saying, well, uh, the left anterior descending is 90% occluded, and the free to the left for phrenoidin is uh, for the you sniff, you know, he starts talking. I'm, I'm like getting my head around this, and I'm going, OK, all right, what are you going to do? And he looked at me with a straight face, and he said, we don't know. And I said, might there be another doctor here who would know? <laughs> and he smiles and he says, no, 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 you don't understand. And this guy was like going to retire, so he was like the head doctor. I live up in Portland, Oregon, so I came, I came a long way to be with you uh, today, which I'm really thrilled, but this is up in Portland. And he looks at this and he points at this and he says, this is the road map. We don't know where the potholes are until we go in. Oh. And you know what the first thing I thought of? The very first thing? Cybersecurity. <laughs> okay, I'm a CISSP, I'm sorry. It's true, it was really weird. It's just like the first thing that came to my mind. So think about it. The world of cybersecurity is filled with potholes, right? And what are you trying to do as professionals? 
We're trying to patch them. We're trying to fill them up. We're trying to go around them. We're trying to mitigate this issue of potholes. And that's what I want you to think about tonight is how can you as a security professional help your company, help the people that you work with identify and patch, fix, repair, eliminate the potholes that are keeping things from flowing. Because your world is like the water faucet, right? Your CEO turns on the water faucet, what do they want? Water. Do they want to think about the plumbing? No. They expect it to be there. They expect it to be what? Water. What else? Clean. clean. What makes it, what tells you it's clean? It's favorite color, clear, right? What else about it? They don't want to worry about the water being turned off. No, they want pressure, right? You want, to, you want to control the pressure. You want to control the temperature. You don't think about the pipes until what? Your socks are wet. <laughs> or they don't work. One of those characteristics is out of place, right? And so let's patch the potholes and let's keep the water flowing. So my first question for you tonight is who can tell me the year in which we uh, had the first recorded ransomware attack? See, there's a shot. You've got to take a shot. I just said ransomware. <laughs> who tell me the year? 2000. 2000. Okay, what else? 2001. It's a space odyssey. <laughs> Anybody else? 1988. 1988? You, sir, will be in the bonus round. You're, very, you're the closest you came to it. It's 1989. And it was during the AIDS epidemic and the AIDS crisis. And some guys got together and they wrote some software. And they, this is how they put it out. It didn't go on a network. It went on the sneaker net. They mailed out 20,000 floppy disks. And you would put it in your computer, and it had to do with AIDS crisis, and you put it in. It was supposed to boot up and tell you something about you know, AIDS research and all this other stuff, and this is what it said. And basically, you know, I've been elected, I love this, I've been elected to inform you that throughout your process of collecting and executing files, you have been accidentally blank yourself over. All right? Again, that's blank yourself over. Just want to make sure you understand that. Okay? It cannot be yes, it can be a virus has infected your system. Now what do you have to say? There is no cure for AIDS. And so you had to pay. Anybody know how much? How much did they pay? Thanks for playing. You have just lost your own in the bonus <laughs> round. No. 169 bucks to get your computer back. So this is when it started. Long, long time ago than what you thought, right? It's been around a long time. And the evolution of this scourge that we like to call it has been a really interesting thing to watch now I started my tech career at IBM in 1981 it was uh, eight years before this happened so that's how old I am and I started I got into cybersecurity in, in 2000 and I've watched this happen this evolution happen uh, the next thing that I really liked was was this and this actually happened to my wife's great aunt who was 95 years old uh, was active on Facebook with all her grandchildren and great whatever. And, and this is what, if you remember this, right? Your computer has been locked, and you're the real official looking thing, and that you're guilty of distributing really bad stuff, and therefore you have to pay $300. And you can go to Walmart and, or Kmart or whatever and get your money pack and pay them 300 bucks. So it's this scare campaign. Okay, this went on, this went on globally. These are pictures of uh, screenshots from all over the world of what was going on back in this time in the 2000s. And my last one is my favorite. This is actually from Palestine, if you believe that. And I think the handcuffs on the keyboard's a nice touch, don't you? <laughs> Just kind of really drives it home. Yeah. So this is what we did. We're scaring. And this was, you think 20,000 floppy disks are a lot? No. This is millions and millions and millions and millions of emails and spam and all this stuff going out there. So then the, uh, the bad guys get smart. And what's the next thing they say? Why should we try to get 300 bucks per computer, right, and make it a numbers game? Let's go right to the source of the money. Now, this is going to hit home a little bit because this is actually Robin Hood, which happened to what city? Oh, my word, really? How many hands am I holding up? 
Do you see any of you are awake here? Greenville got hit with this. Robin Hood in 19, uh, not, not 19, uh, 2019. Okay, Baltimore got hit with this. This was really one of the big ones that happened in the last five years. So I, wanna, I want you to, to really understand, this is great. I love how uh, hackers communicate, right? Your network targeted by Robinhood ransomware. We've been watching you for days, they say. And we've worked on your systems to gain full access to your company and bypass all your protections. You must pay us in four days. If you don't pay in the specified duration, the price increases $10,000 each day after the period. After 10 days, your keys and your panel will be removed automatically. I don't know, I've never had my panel removed. I've had a lot of surgeries in my life, but that one has never been removed. Don't know what that is. Uh, have your panel removed uh, automatically, and you won't be able to get, this is a typo, you are, just ask Google, <laughs> okay? the, the font of all things, the fount of all knowledge. Don't upload your files to virus total or services like that. Don't call the FBI or other security organizations. For security reasons, don't shut down your systems. You know the worst thing you can do is reboot, right? OK, good. Uh, don't recover your computer. Don't rename your files. It will damage your files. All procedures are automated, so don't ask for more time or some things like that. We won't talk more. All we know is money. <laughs> Isn't this great? Yeah, that's just great. If you don't care about yourself, we won't too. So do not waste your time and hurry up. Tick tack, tick tack. So wait a minute. That's an indicator. It is. It's a specific indicator of where this came from. Why is that? Who knows? We say, what do we say? Tick-tock. What do they say in Russia? Tick-tack. Tick okay, so that's your first clue of where this is coming from. Okay, now, what happened to your files? All your files are locked and protected by strong encryption with RSA 4096 ciphers. For more information about RSA can be found here. <laughs> and they give you the Wikipedia. They give you the Wikipedia uh, just in case you wanted to know. All right, in summary, see? as opposed to springery, which we're in now, <laughs> summary, you can't read or work with your files, but with our help, you can recover them. It's impossible to recover your files without private key and our unlocking software. You can Google Baltimore City, Greenville City, and Robinhood ransomware, okay? Just a little ad for themselves. And then this is the favorite part of it. Just pay the ransomware and end the suffering and then get better cybersecurity. <laughs> This is real stuff, okay, happening now, today. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating, okay? And this, but this, you know, this is, we've had fun with this, okay? We've laughed at it, uh, but it's serious, you know? It really is. And Baltimore and Greenville and anyone who's been hit with this or some other version, we don't mean to make light of it. It is, it is tough, you know? And so how do we, how do we combat that? And I want to, I want to craft it in uh, a ransomware 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, if I may. Okay, I want to talk in those terms about the, uh, the, um, how the bad guys go after you and how you need to respond uh, to be effective. So there's this blast radius we talk about, right, that if they can get in and they continue to have access and they continue to cause problems, it causes more and more issues for you and your organization, certainly. So 1.0 is, is what we saw in this evolution of ransomware is this idea of encrypting the files. They're going to get in, they're going to make things inaccessible uh, so that you can't perform activities. Uh, we've all, you know, been through part of this and when the systems are down, right, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, so this is the first thing they go after. So the first response when, when the 1.0 started, the first response was fine, we'll just restore from backups. We got the backups, but do you, right? And how old are they and how accessible are they? How quickly can you re respond? So the, the bad guys say, okay, fine. We will destroy your backups. Now what are you gonna do, right? We're gonna drive you to pay. Everything is all about the money, right? So now you don't have access to your backups and then ransomware 3.0 is the fact that they're gonna take your data and they're going to do something with it and there's Great, you know, a lot of threats around, we're going to expose things. 
very sensitive data. Sony was a data, bre data breach that was not technically ransomware, and it was back maybe 10, 8 or 10 years ago, uh, but a lot of very important data that has been trying to be exposed. So these are the concerns that you have to, you have to deal with. And frankly, you know, I think in a way the term ransomware has, we've evolved to where the, the suffix where may not even be appropriate because sometimes it's not a piece of malware that's doing the job. Sometimes it's a credential that's been removed or uh, uh, pilfered, right? And they're just getting access. So it's all about access. So here's some survey stuff we did that uh, asking people how they feel about data breaches and such and, and how they're prepared for it. This is my favorite, well, 81%, uh, sorry, get to something in a moment. 81% of attacks are now featuring ransomware. Now featuring ransomware. So uh, it's really taken off and it's growing, right? 10% of all data breaches now involve ransomware. That's up two times uh, year over year. And this average cost of the data breach is somewhere around four million. That's going to move and shift based on cost per record and, and different things like that is how, how you're going to, to calculate that. So we asked our customers and we said, okay, how do you feel about uh, this whole aspect and what, what do you need and what do you have? And we put out a whole bunch of surveys. Here are three things that, or four things that really hit me. And this is my favorite one. 95% want to detect threats earlier. So my question is, who's the 5%? Yes, really. Are there people out there that are like, oh, we're fine. Anybody? Can we get 5% of this room? You're fine? No, maybe they have MSSPs that, you know, alerts. <laughs> yeah. They don't have to worry about it. They're not the ones that are doing it. That's true. But there's always room for improvement, right? Okay, so 80% of ransomware is changing. Eight, excuse me, 80% of our respondents said that ransomware is changing how traditional IT and InfoSec are working together. And this is something I'm very happy to see. Because traditionally, InfoSec would write a security policy and do what with it? Throw it over the fence, basically, right? And say, here, go implement this. And there's been this divide for a long time. And we still talk about it today around infrastructure versus security. The best companies are the ones that have melded this and merged this so that everybody's working together to solve this problem, okay? And that's a huge thing. I'm a big, big proponent of this. And then the same percentage or so said that it's changing the way we think of data management. Ransomware is changing the way that we used to think of it very, very differently. I mean, look what's happened over the last almost 20 years. How much data do you have compared to 20 years ago? Anybody thought that you would be dealing with as much data as you are? No. No. I mean, it's, you know, petabyte, we're talking about exabytes and zettabytes. And who knows what comes after zettabytes? Anybody? No. Nope. Yottabytes. Like yada, yada, yada. That's the way I remember it, okay? I mean, it's just crazy. It's just crazy amount of data. And so how we respond to it, we're, we're driving the change to uh, data management. Tell my wife, I'll call her right back. <laughs> One more time. Okay, good. And then, uh, you know, it, it's becoming part of the strategy. It really is data management. So I'm glad to see these things, uh, these things melding. All right, let's talk about 1.0. On the left, all the data sources that you have, people, things, apps, everything that connects to your world. And in the right, what do you need to do to protect what's in the middle? And that's the data. It's all about the data. Data is your currency. It has to be treated like currency in order to be successful in managing it and securing it, all right? So, you put wrappers around it. And we have traditionally put these wrappers to ensure that we control the access. But your data should be encrypted. You should have a system that has fault tolerance associated with it in, in managing that data and backing it up, et cetera, et cetera. And then these wrappers around access uh, and detection, OK? So first of all, the, the outside wrapper is what I call the burnt marshmallow syndrome. Nobody's heard of the burnt marshmallow syndrome? 
Anybody like burnt marshmallows? Somebody must. Good. Thanks. Thanks for playing, sir. Uh, you know, what's a burnt marshmallow? It's crusty on the outside, right? What's going on on the inside? Ooey, gooey, fluid, moving all over the place. That's like most environments. We've worked so hard to create a perimeter and to protect things, but we've taken our focus around what's going on on the inside. And that's where the guys are like, you know, going through the purse, you know, and grummaging and looking around, and we're just, <laughs> and then they go back at it. So we got to get our eyes on the inside. So detection analysis, this wrapper. And, and with this wrapper, you've got to identify anomalies. You've got to look into the data, understand what's there, especially if you're going to use it as a backup, because the worst thing you can do is what? Restore an anomaly, right? And just keep playing the, the circle game there. You've got to have access control. You've got to have multi-factor. And now, I mean, we're worrying to pass keys and all the new uh, things that are happening around access. Uh, Role-based access control. These are the basic building blocks that need to exist in order to recover from an attack. So at Cohesity, we're, we're really trying to focus on the fact that it's recovery because it's going to happen. You're going to need to recover. And it may not be ransomware. It might be uh, a well-meaning, stupid person that does something. Or uh, I know you like to call the users carbon-based life form units, basically. But uh, right, it's going to be something that's going to happen. Uh, auditing, we've heard about auditing uh, earlier, uh, which is really important. Uh, any auditors in the room today? OK, we can, oh, you wrote, oh, shucks, darn it. I thought we were free uh, to talk freely. But welcome. It's nice to have you, sir. Uh, <laughs> buy this guy a drink. Give him a shot. Uh, but really, when the auditor comes in, what's the first lie you tell them? Hi, it's nice to see you. That's the first lie you start with. And then, right? You happen to see you all the time. OK, good. So these are the building blocks that have to happen. OK, then I can hopefully uh, recover as I, as I go down the road. Now. We've added a couple of things. I'm, I'm just doing a little bit of, it's not really a sales pitch. I just want to explain. We have this uh, feature we call quorum. What's a quorum? It's a group of people, right? But what are the rules around a quorum for getting things done? You have to have a minimum number to say, right? Like if you have a quorum of seven, then you need how many votes? Four votes, right? You need a max, you need a, a majority, right? So quorum is a function that we have in our system that allows you to set and say, in order for decisions to be made or somebody to do certain things, you have to have a quorum. You have to have, here's the list of all the people, and if three of them agree or five of them agree or whatever it is, then OK. So it's the two keys type thing to, to launch the missile. Really, really, really critical. And then obviously, you've got to continuously monitor. And you think about what, what Eric, here's Eric, what you talked about, right? Your, your message to me over and over and over again was, you've got to keep doing it over and over again, right? As far as policies are concerned, you're always monitoring. You're always going through that process over and over and over. That's the message. OK, so then you establish, sorry, I'll be all right. Uh, I'll try not to buy anything tonight. I haven't even had a shot today. It's good. Um, then we get working on this zero trust. Now, that's a whole other topic. We could talk for a long time around zero trust and what that means. And it's, it's not, there's no skew. You can go out and ask a vendor to buy zero trust. It means a lot of things of putting in a lot of places. But that's where we're trying to get to, right, is to get to zero trust. And then, finally, your backup, whatever you write, needs to be immutable, cannot be changed. Once you get to that point, there's a big head nod there. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, can I get an amen? amen. And an A-women. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we've got to, got to cover that. We've got to cover that. All right, so immutability is really, really critical in protecting your data because you've got to know that it hasn't changed. You have to have confidence in what it is that you're writing, wherever it is that, to which you're writing, OK? So then now what I get, right? I have resilience against ransomware. I have archives that are tamper resistant. I know I can go back. And this is the biggest problem in ransomware is, uh, or recovery in general, is I'm going back in time and where do I have to go? How far back do I have to go? The whole idea of RTO and RPO, uh, and here we are in RTP. Isn't that interesting how that works? <laughs> uh, RTO and RT, uh, M-O-U-S-E, right. Um, those are good starting points, but they don't define the whole thing, right? You've got to really figure out 
what do I need to go back to? And so the uh, tamper resistant is really, really critical. So this gives us the 2.0. If they're going to uh, affect the backups, you put these things in play, now you can recover because you have the immutability, you have sure that nobody has gotten uh, inappropriate access to it, you have confidence that you can recover from uh, that data set, whatever it is you've written, right? Okay, we good? All right, so 3.0, let's talk about the fact that uh, 3.0, when they want to take the data, exfiltrate the data, there's a couple other things that we need to add. We've got to be able to detect threats early. If you look at a timeline and you say, okay, I did a backup here, and then time goes on, I do another backup, whatever that interval is, right, and I'm, I'm repeating that over some period of time. Somewhere in that timeline, you get an infection. Something happens, bad guys get in. But generally, what happens in the challenge is that you don't see it, you don't recognize it. And so what do you do? You, your next backup includes what? The bad stuff, right? And that just goes on and on and on. And so now when something happens, you start going back and back and back and back and realizing, oh man, it's a long way back to get to a clean uh, restore point. And so the sooner you can do this, the better. This is, uh, this is one thing that an organization should really focus on. How quickly can I detect something happening in my data? And especially in your backups because that's where they like to get in and, and rummage around. It's the purse thing, right? And I lived in London for a while, London, England, uh, had a wonderful time there, and we were eating in Piccadilly Circus, my wife and I at a, at a little casual restaurant, and some guy stole her purse, basically. And you know what? I, I wasn't gonna talk about this, but hey, I am. Um, I was so impressed by this guy. <laughs> I really was, I have to say. It was one of the best theft, thefts I've ever witnessed. Uh, he was, he was uh, totally uh, got my attention to go somewhere else while he did his thing. And I, I'm an amateur magician, actually, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of misdirection. <laughs> and he did this, and he ran around the corner, literally, and just went through it. Here's an iPhone, here's this, there's that. And we literally found the handbag with the iPhone gone and the wallet gone and everything. This is what's happening with the bad guys. They're in there rummaging around. The sooner you can detect that, the better off you are, right? Okay, so here's now another one, data classification. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. I mentioned earlier that data is like your currency. Think about it, you're driving down the road, you come to an intersection, there's somebody standing there with a sign asking for help. Would you give them a $50 bill? Probably not. Would you give them a one or a five? Maybe, I'm not here to debate the rights or wrongs of that. But the reason that you make that choice is because you value those bills in your wallet very differently. The same thing is true about the data in your system. How do you know what to protect? If I asked you, how much data, how much of your data do you back up? What would you say? Everything, right? And you know what I'm gonna say next? Why? Because I was told to, right? <laughs> okay, I have to. Classification of data allows you to say, well, here's my hundreds, and here's my fifties, and I can now put different controls around them and know that the hundreds are totally protected and that I get down to my ones, what might I do with the ones? I could put them in the cloud maybe and say if they got stolen or if I got lost, I'd be okay. Or you know what else you can do? Delete them. Deleting data is very therapeutic. <laughs> Feels really good, but it's super hard to do. And for a lot of reasons, you don't want to do it. But every data retention policy also has a data deletion clause, okay? But we hold on to those things. We're just, we're hoarders. We are, it's terrible. So classification, really important. Behavioral ana analytics. Understand what's happening. There's lots of systems that can help you identify this is out of order. Entropy, okay, we do a big thing with entropy around random, you know, daily change rate, randomness of data. The things are just not quite what they should be. They're different than they were. What's the behavior of people and of the data? This stuff gives you this insight. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, security and governance, or 
IT management, data management, and security have to merge. This is my favorite animation. Wasn't that cool? Do you want to see it again? <laughs> it's really nice. Watch, watch, watch this. <sighs> it happens every time. Doesn't matter what screen I'm on. Isn't that great? So this is what it's all about. Who has access? How do you know? Okay. Uh, where is it? How do you prove compliance? All this stuff we talk about auditing. Classification, it's really important. It's really, really critical. So let's do what you can to merge these things in your, in your business. We do a lot in our business as a field CISO for Cohesity. You know, we started as a data backup, as a, as a data management company, and we're making this switch to data security. So I go in, I have lots of conversations with infrastructure people uh, about security. And it's a learning process. And I'm finding the more I talk with the infrastructure folks, they're saying, oh, well, this is interesting. Let me bring uh, Bill in or Susie in or whatever, and let's talk about this. And you know, that makes my heart feel good. I need my heart to feel good uh, of bringing these things together. So do what you can to make that happen, OK? Let's, t let's wrap up with some best practices of, of some things that we talked about. Number one, it's all, you, you really have to protect the backups. And you have to make them accessible, right? Uh, you have to do this to enforce data protection. You've got to do the worm, right? The worm is not a dance uh, after you've had too many shots. Uh, it's the write once and read many. You've got to enable this uh, because it's the key to the immutability and all the stuff behind the scenes. Um, and an air gap, an air gap vault, the important stuff in an air gap vault. That's, that's really, really critical. That, uh, that you go down these roads to, to protect the data. Secondly, it's still around the perimeter, okay? It's still around the environment. The environment, the perimeter's dying, right? It's broken. We have the edge, we have data. Data's like water. It finds the lowest point of any place you put it. It just runs everywhere, and it's going farther and farther away from our center, but we still have to protect the systems that are engaged in managing those things, right? So multi-factor, privileged across systems. I mean, um, le least privilege, keep the platform and workloads up to date. This right here, right here, the grunt work of IT, patching, right? All the things, that have, time and time and time again, a problem, a breach, whatever is because they didn't do these things. You've got to block and tackle. You have to do the basics. It's just over and over and over again. The, uh, the Greenville, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Greenville thing was a common uh, a CVE, right? A, an old, well-known vulnerability that was patched long ago, but didn't get patched at Greenville. It's just you've got to, got to, got to, got to do it, right? All right. Monitor the most important stuff. Protect the crown jewels. It's all about the most important data. Um, when you think about recovery, you like, OK, what are we going to recover first? What applications are we going to recover first? And in what order? These are things that if you don't understand what's your most important stuff, really hard to answer the question. One of the things we're uh, piloting right now, and I'm going to be doing this uh, next month, uh, are some ransomware workshops where we bring uh, folks together and we say, okay, you're now the CEO and you're the CIO. This, uh, the, uh, the, it won't last long, so enjoy it while you can. Uh, uh, you're the CISO, right? You get these, uh, what are they called? Uh, help me out. Promotion. Promotion, thank you, thank you, yes. It's a long day. Um, and we bring in, and it's just like an uh, environment, we just put you through it and say, you know, now what do you do? Here's what happened. Here's, this has just taken place. Now what do you do? Are you going to pay the ransom? Are you going to, how are you going to communicate with the public? How are you going to communicate uh, in these ways? Who's authorized to pay in Bitcoin? Lots of things that you don't think about. So anything you can do from a tabletop perspective, really, really critical. Know what you have. Discover the sensitive data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, it, it ha you have to take the responsibility f of the organization. And I know you all have different positions. Some of you have more clout than others within an organization. Uh, that's all well and good. But we have to wave the banner. 
We have to be the noisy wheel or squeaky wheel and prepare. You've got to practice. Do as many tabletops as you can because this is going to happen. And again, maybe it's not ransomware. And, and there's also this attitude of we're too small. Nobody's going to tackle us. Mm -mm. You can't think in those terms because you're going to need to recover someday. And you need to understand what to do. Let's put it this way. Let's say you write a playbook out and you've got the playbook and you put it on SharePoint and then ransomware happens and you can't get to what? <laughs> SharePoint. <laughs> now what do you do? Here's a case in point. C Katrina came through uh, Gulf of Mexico, what, 2006? Approximately, right? Five? Okay. Um, I was consulting with one of the oil companies that lost a bunch of rigs there. You know, terrible. And a lot of companies had really bad things happen to them. And they lost all the data. And those rigs are full of computers, right? They're full of data. And so they're going to say, well, we're going to just restore from backup. Now, this is 2005, and what are they backing up from? Tape, tape right? Yeah. Guess where they kept their tapes? The no, give them some credit. It weren't on the rigs, OK? <laughs> they weren't on the rigs. <laughs> give them a little credit, OK? <laughs> That's it. Downtown New Orleans, literally. <laughs> Might as well have been on the rigs, right? Couldn't get to it for six months. So I got a plan. I got a plan. Where's your plan? It's uh, over there, you know. They got it. So these are the things to think about, right? Uh, layered defenses, skills assessment, training for all your personnel. This is what you have to do. These things, among others, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these things will help you patch the potholes in your world and let the water flow. So when it's on, it flows as you expect it and as you want it to. You don't get the phone calls and emails that you don't want from the people that you really don't want to talk to, right? So how does, how does the uh, IT manager talk to the CEO? Turn their email off. They'll call you. Trust me, they will. Don't get in there. Patch, 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 patch. So for me, the, the, to close my story, I went ahead and I had a quadruple bypass heart surgery. And it was very invasive. They had to turn my heart over and work on the backside. Uh, I had arrhythmia. My, and I, I spent uh, two days in the ICU. I spent eight days in the hospital because I, my heart wouldn't settle down. And it was a long, hard road. I went home and I, uh, prior to my uh, surgery, I, I knew I was going to spend about six weeks in a recliner. So what did I do? I bought a new recliner. Exactly. <laughs> what else did I buy? The biggest TV I could find. Exactly. <laughs> See, guys know what I'm talking about. Guys are like, yeah. And because I knew I was going to be stuck. And that's what I did. That's when I also started to learn magic, by the way. So I sat there with a deck of cards. And tried to learn. So, my road, uh, patching my road, was this long process. And I went through lots of different therapies and physical therapy. I remember going the first time when they said, okay, you're on the treadmill. Okay, the treadmill was flat. And they said, okay, walk on the treadmill. This is how fast I walked. Literally, that was as fast as I went. And they go, can you do five minutes? I, I'm a guy. Yeah, I can do five minutes. No problem. I get about three minutes, and I'm just like, oh. I did the five minutes and went home and slept for three hours. <laughs> and that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And pretty soon I started to feel better, and I started to feel stronger. And I got to the point where I said, yes, this was beneficial to me. And early on, I didn't know. I wasn't sure. It was, it was painful. But I went through it, and I got better, and I got better. And pretty soon I was like up and going, another thing, and my wife would say to me, we just hit our 45th anniversary, by the way, so we've been through this a long time. It's, it, thank you. It's, it's, it's been the best 43 years of my life. It's just been great. A um, couple of years in there. Without, no, it's true. It's true. Uh, 45 years to one woman, and I died. Okay, just to clarify that. So my wife was all concerned about me before surgery. She's like, you know, you're tired. You come home, and you're just tired all the time. I want to go do things. And I'm like, well, I'm getting old. You know, I deserve to rest. I got fixed. I didn't know I was sick. I got fixed, and I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm taking the trash out, and I have some paper bags here that I folded very neatly, and I've stacked them in order, so in sizes, so if you need any paper bags, they're right over here. I mean, I was just a total different person. And that's what will happen to your environment. As you find these potholes and as you patch them, 
great things happen. The business starts running. The, and your, your job of keeping the revenue generating clock running, because that's really what your job is, will happen efficiently and effectively. And that's the thing that you, you focus on. So think about the potholes in your world. Think about what you can do to bring data management and data security together. And above all, have fun with it, because it's, it's, it's sad enough as it is in our, to talk about these things. But enjoy it. Enjoy the ride, and it will improve your world and your business and your relationships and everything else. So it's just great to be with you. Thank you for your time tonight.